everybody, it's Susan from CRD here. Uh, welcome back to our channel, I know it's been a while. Today we're going to demystify our latest research that just came out on prostate cancer and a potential new biomarker and therapeutic target for it. And we're also going to give you a bit of a career update because it's actually been a while since we've, we've talked to you about kind of that side of, of cancer research. Or if I'm honest, it's been a while since we've talked to you about, well, anything. So I'll give you that update first. If you're not interested in the update and you want to skip straight to the science, I'd recommend you skip to about 10 minutes into this video and that should get you roughly to the start of it. Okay, so firstly for the career stuff, well, you probably noticed that Haley and I haven't been that active on YouTube this year. We've been slacking pretty hard, but you may have still seen us on like Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, all of those other places talking about CRD and about cancer research in general. We haven't been making that many videos and that's because they're a lot more time consuming and the two of us are absolutely slammed right there. Uh, but that is actually a good thing. We've both moved on in our careers, we're both climbing up that ladder and it's actually a really, really exciting time for both of us. The downside is we're not actually in the same location anymore, so you're probably not going to see any more videos of the two of us in white lab coats standing next to each other in the lab, which is really sad. Maybe in the future, but probably not anytime soon, really. Um, but we have both got exciting news. I'll let Haley tell you her own herself, um, and then I will tell you mine today. So when we first started filming these videos way back about five years ago, uh, we were both postdocs. I, I was a postdoc, and that is a, a word that, that we use just like a short term in academia for postdoctoral researcher. That means you've already done your doctorate or your PhD. So you, you've kind of done your training, you understand cancer research, and now you're a staff member. You're working somewhere, studying cancer, researching it, and learning more about it. Um, and you're, you're a member of staff, but you're a team member of a wider, wider team led by someone more senior than yourself, known as a PI, or principal investigator. Now, in other fields, that might be known as like your boss or your team lead, or team manager or supervisor or something like that. In academia, we call it PI. So you'll hear that word thrown around. We're not talking about private investigators. We're talking about principal investigators. Um, so during the time that we've been filming for CRD, I progressed a little bit within that lab, so I did get a personal fellowship, very generously awarded to me by Prostate Cancer UK, which meant that I had my own funding, I was able to start asking my own questions, and in a technical sense, I was actually a PI, at least listed on the grant as a PI, but I wasn't leading my own team, I was still in someone else's team. So it's kind of baby steps towards independence. And you've guessed it, since then, excitingly, I've now become a PI myself. So um, this has really always been my dream. I, I'm kind of living my dream now, as, as cheesy as it sounds. Um, it's something I've always really, really wanted. From a practical and kind of personal standpoint, it means I'm now permanently employed rather than on short-term contracts funded by, by generous funding bodies. Instead, I'm now a permanent member of staff at a university who pay my salary themselves. Uh, in the US, you might hear this term referred to as tenure, and we do sometimes use this word here in the UK as well. Um, but for me, my, my new job title is a lecturer in translational medicine at UCL, and it's a really, really exciting time for me. Now, the slight caveat to that is that I did start this role in April 2020. <laughs> you may remember that wasn't really the best month for the world. We, we had like one or two small little troubles going on at the time. So it meant that me kind of launching my own team and starting my own cancer research team took a bit of a back seat for a while. So I, I made some videos from home um, in, my, in my previous tiny little apartment where we were holed up on the kitchen table doing our, our work from home. Um, and I told you I would update how that was going. So I, I did make one video a few weeks into COVID talking about the different kinds of things that we were able to do from home as cancer researchers. I said I'd update you, I didn't really do it, things got a bit crazy, but 18 months later I guess this video is kind of serving as that update. Um, so, so basically during this time I've had this kind of lag phase of slowly, slowly, slowly building my team, but it is actually happening now. So for the last few months, uh, in 2021, I've been back in the lab in UCL and actually taking on my own PhD students and postdocs and undergrads and everything. And it's starting to actually look like, 
what I guess we can now call the Healy Lab, which is a bit of a, a pinch me moment for me as a, as a cancer researcher, because that really was my dream for my, for my whole career. So I'm, I'm lucky enough that I'm currently supervising four amazing PhD students. Um, and what's even better is that um, they're all co-supervised by other amazing people in the department. They're, they're all more experienced than me. I'm definitely the new guy. Um, but they're three amazing women in science who are fantastic mentors to me and to our PhD students. So they've been able to provide really valuable advice to our students from different areas that I'm less expert in and they're more expert in. So really, really useful collaborations. Um, both for our students, but also for me. So that, that's been a really wonderful time. So those are uh, Professor Umber Chima, who is our head of center at the Center for 3D Models of Health and Disease. Uh, Dr. Irini Valiu, who is an amazing 3D cancer models researcher. And also Dr. Kate Ricketts, who you've actually met on this channel before. If, if you remember, we had a video about radiotherapy and proton beam therapy. And Kate did some beautiful explanations on how all of that works. And I'm actually co-supervising two of her students at the moment. So that's been really, really exciting uh, for me in my career. And it's lovely to watch these four students kind of starting out on their, their cancer research journey. I have very fond memories of my own PhD. So it's, it's lovely to watch them doing the same. Uh, I've also been lucky enough to take on a visiting postdoc who's joining us from industry. He brings a wealth of experience and is a super fan of one of the techniques that I'm really into that's called spatial transcriptomics. So the two of us have been kind of nerding out together about that and that's been really, really enjoyable. Um, and excitingly, I've just recruited a new postdoc who's going to start in the new year as well. Um, and she is going to be a brilliant addition to the team. I can't wait to have her on board. We've also got seven undergrad students this year doing research projects with us. So once you add all of those in who will be with us between sort of two months to nine months, depending on the project, all of those together, it becomes quite a large team. And we've actually got a few irons in the fire with maybe two more PhD students, possibly due to start sometime in the new year. Actually, maybe even three now that I think about it. So it, it, it's definitely a period of sudden expansion. Um, for most of COVID, I was a team of one working from home on my kitchen table, no one to look after, no one to uh, brainstorm with, just kind of, well, other than my poor husband, who was a trooper, um, but no one to kind of, you know, lead or, or start that kind of dream team that I've always wanted, whereas now it's actually happening. And although it's been a bit of a delay, it's definitely worth the wait. It's uh, such an exciting time for us. So I will get into the science in a moment, but um, just a bit of a preamble to that is that um, it's actually quite a, I think, a timely uh, project to talk about because this project that I'm going to explain today was fully carried out in COVID. So from the first conception, the first idea, all the way through the project planning, carrying out the project itself, analyzing it, writing it up, publishing it to now today where the paper just came out, that whole process all happened since COVID started. So it was a fully at home project, which is not something I've ever done before. Um, everything happened on, on computers at home. There was no white coats involved. There was no lab bench involved. There was no pets involved. Believe it or not, I actually haven't even met the person who led this project face to face yet. And I feel like she's practically my little sister at this point because we've spent so much time talking to each other about cancer research for the last year and a half. But we've never met face to face. So, I mean, COVID was a difficult time, but gosh, some really amazing things did come from it. The fact that that's possible nowadays is, I think, a really beautiful thing. Um, so today is her day. It's a fantastic celebration of her work all the way from start to finish. Um, and that's what we're going to demystify in the, in the demystified part of this video. Um, I wish she could do it herself, but as she will hopefully let you know, because I think she's uh, recording a video for us today from clinic. Uh, she's she's kind of busy in the clinic, so um, she I, I will try my best to, to do her work justice and demystify it for you, um, and hopefully we'll get that hello from her later. Um, and with that, I think we'll move into the demystified part of the video. was led by the incredible Nafisa Barma. She is a medical student who joined me during COVID for a seven-week project 
uh, as part of her intercalated BSc in Surgical Sciences. Now, she had never done computational biology really before, it was her first research project, and the fact that she was able to get to a paper that's now been published with her as first author is absolutely incredible, particularly within that time frame. So, firstly, credit where credit is due. Well done, Nafisa, what a trooper. Um, but the science itself is about something called BRD9. So, BRD9 is a new gene of interest for us. It hasn't been that well studied in cancer. And in fact, when I first suggested this project to Nafisa, there were actually no papers on BRD9 in prostate cancer. Now, that changed quite quickly because between her choosing the project and starting the project, someone actually published a paper on BRD9 in prostate cancer, which is always one of those moments in research where you're like, oh great, someone else is thinking along the same lines as us, but you're also thinking, oh no, did they scoop us? Did they, did they do the work we were planning to do? Um, but fortunately, it worked out really well on this occasion. They had done some beautiful, beautiful wet lab work on cell lines and animal models of prostate cancer and looking at how this new gene of interest kind of behaves in them. Now, our work was obviously going to be from home because it was COVID. Nafisa was setting out to characterize how this gene behaves in publicly available data sets for prostate cancer. So, one of the really useful things that researchers can access from home and that I think I mentioned in our previous uh, at home cancer research video is that there are quite a large number of publicly available data sets. These are things where we've done sequencing or other kind of next generation, you know, fancy techniques on, on prostate cancer patient samples, um, analyze them and then share them with the community. So they could be from researchers in any country in the world who've already done their work, they've published their paper, and then they make the actual data set that they generated available for anyone to look at and to reinterpret. So for example, if someone wanted to look at all of the genes in the genome in prostate cancer, which is something that people often do, they might publish that and look at some areas of interest within the genome, a few genes here, a few genes there, but make the whole thing available so that anyone else and look at their genes of interest. This is really useful when it comes to a brand new project like this. Very, very little work done to date on the gene or protein BRD9, and it, you know, it, it was really a good time to actually look at that publicly available data and kind of say, well, how does this gene behave in prostate cancer? You know, is it worth us doing some wet lab work in this down the line when, when COVID ends? Is, is, is this something we should look into further? So the timing worked out quite well, and Nafisa dove in head first and got some amazing data, and I'll take you through that now, figure by figure. So firstly, regarding BRD9 as a potential biomarker, um, if you don't know what a biomarker is, this is something that we kind of test for, for cancers to help us diagnose a cancer, or maybe to help us understand if that cancer can be treated in a certain way with a certain drug, or how the patient is kind of likely to progress in their disease. Um, they're kind of little gene clues that, that kind of tell us what might happen with the disease. Um, BRD9 as a biomarker showed us some mixed results. It does seem to be um, more highly associated with prostate cancer tissue than with normal tissue, um, and particularly a, a noticeable difference in metastatic prostate cancer tissue compared to the primary site. Now, when I say metastatic prostate tissue, if you don't know that word, I'm talking about a cancer that is spread to a distant site in the body. Um, so Nafisa found that when cancer does that, maybe BRD9 is more likely to be highly expressed. So maybe BRD9 might be a sort of biomarker of metastases. Now, in some other areas, the data wasn't that clear. So looking at BRD9's association with response to treatment, didn't really give us very clear answers. And that's mostly because there's just not that much data out there. These publicly available data sets are fantastic. But there isn't always that much follow on data. So quite often they will tell us that a patient went on to be treated with chemotherapy or with radiotherapy or whatever it might be, but they don't then have the data to say whether the patient responded well to that treatment or not. Um, so that's something as a community I really hope that we get better on. We've got these beautiful data sets out there. You know, Nafisa found 11 data sets for this paper from, um, so 11 completely independent cohorts across the world. 
and it was I think over 2,000 patients across those and that's a huge amount of data but it didn't always have that much follow-up information so when she was trying to figure out you know does BRD9 associate with response to say chemotherapy or radiotherapy her answer was generally that we we don't know yet um, so that's kind of one caveat to this paper but in terms of the biomarker stuff yeah it does seem that um, BRD9 is associated seemingly with um, cancer spreading to distant sites in the body and potentially to the cancer being more aggressive as well. Now, the one previous paper on BRD9 in prostate cancer was specifically looking at BRD9 in prostate cancer that has become castrate resistant. This is how we refer to prostate cancer that has progressed after treating with an antiandrogen therapy. So those hormone therapies that you may have heard of prostate cancer patients being treated with. So they've been given this therapy and it stopped working after a while. These patients, maybe BRD9 might be a good drug target there. So we're not really talking so much about kind of biomarkers anymore. We're moving into the space of treatment. So can we develop drugs uh, that actually target BRD9 and help prostate cancer patients, particularly maybe those castrate resistant prostate cancer patients? So that's what that kind of other group thought. And we obviously wanted to see if we could validate this. Again, we don't have much publicly available data on patients that have already progressed after treatment, unfortunately, but we could look at how BRD9 associates with the androgen receptor, which is the target of a lot of these hormone therapies. And we find that there's a negative correlation here. This could mean that when BRD9 is high, AR tends to be low. And so the, the kind of clinical meaning of that is that if we were to inhibit or target BRD9, in patients, even the ones that have low androgen receptor expression, maybe there, there could be some clinical utility here. So while it was hard for us to kind of directly validate what that other paper had looked at, we're suddenly seeing that there does seem to be scope for, for targeting BRD9 in, in cancer patients and potentially in those aggressive cancer patients that we're particularly looking for new good drugs in. Now, the next thing that Nafisa did was even more work, it was a huge amount of work. She, she went through a, a range of different well-known drug targets and signaling pathways and biological mechanisms that happen in prostate cancer. She went through them step by step, gene by gene, protein by protein, and tried to predict as best she could from this data whether BRD9 could be co-targeted well with any of those. So the phrase co-targeting is something that I've spent a lot of my career researching. It's where we look at two drugs or maybe one drug that targets two different things. So instead of, for example, just targeting BRD9, you know, inhibiting the expression of BRD9, maybe we actually look at doing that in combination with something else. Um, and I've taken this approach in quite a few of the different projects that I've been a part of over the years. Um, and so it's an interest of mine and it's something that we wanted to look into here. Theoretically, if you can find a really good co-target for a new drug target like this, then maybe you can treat a patient with very low doses of two or more drugs rather than a high dose of one drug. And what we really hope, theoretically, is that that gives us the best ability to really inhibit the tumor's growth itself without having all of those nasty side effects that are so commonly associated with cancer treatments. So if we're going with lower doses of different things that each kind of selectively go for those nasty cancer cells, then hopefully we're getting a better response and fewer side effects, which is definitely a win-win. So it's hard to summarize Nafisa's findings from this because they're not small, there's a lot of them, and they're mostly in the supplementary data for the paper, which is a file that, you know, really the, the more interested cancer researchers who are desperate to find out the nitty gritty will separately download to the paper and go through and say, okay, what did they find here? What did they find there? But, but she did pull together a, a summary for the paper, which I'll show now. And in general, what this says to us is that there is some promise for BRD9 as a co-target with certain other pathways, but not with everything. Um, and this kind of brings me on to the broader point that I want to make from this paper. So we know that BRD9 based on this does seem to show some promise as a biomarker in certain circumstances, but not others. It does seem to show some promise as a drug target. 
in certain circumstances, but not others. And so by having done this work in just the publicly available stuff, just on our computers at home, it allows us to really refine what we're going to do when we get into the lab. And so there are a number of students following on the, the next year after Nafisa, so um, the 2021-2022 students, are going to come in and look at this in the wet lab. But they've got this huge wealth of information before they start based on Nafisa's work. It means that they're not going to waste time looking at BRD9, co-targeting with the wrong targets. They're not going to waste time looking at targeting BRD9 in the wrong types of patients. Because she's already shown where it's of more use and of less use. So this is something that in an ideal world, we would have always done. I look back on my PhD and this is not how I started. I was uh, looking at targeting and co-targeting different pathways and different genes and proteins within lung cancer and I did not start with publicly available data um, and that wasn't because I, I made a huge mistake don't jump to conclusions here guys it, it was just because that wasn't really available back then publicly available data is something that's really only been on the horizon kind of increasing over the last few years we did have one or two data sets that we could access um, back then, but you really needed to be a bit of a computational biologist or a bioinformatician, a real kind of coder. You needed to have a lot of experience at the computational side of things to be able to, to understand the, those data sets. Whereas nowadays, anyone can do it. They're actually on these really, really easy to use websites. And if you've got a decent understanding of biology or medicine, I would say undergrad level and higher. Um, if maybe if you did biology for the A-levels or the Leaving Cert or equivalent and you were really into it, then maybe you'd be able to try this too. Um, but you certainly don't need to have, you know, a professorship in computational biology to be able to use these websites. Not anymore, anyway. They're really user-friendly and really accessible to the broader, broader cancer research community, including amazing students like Nafisa. There's also just far more data, and actually every day when I log on to those websites, there's more and more data. Nafisa's paper literally came out today, and it's already out of date in terms of those 11 cohorts that we looked at. There's a few more that have already come out since we did. So this is a field that is really expanding quite rapidly. And I think as cancer researchers, it's important for us to kind of go with the flow on that and actually take that on board and start to rethink how we approach our cancer research projects. So moving forward, I intend to always start projects like this. So do the computational work first, it's quite quick. Nafisa did this in seven weeks, whereas a wet lab paper usually takes a year or two at least. Um, and it, it gives you that real sense of what we should look at in the wet lab and what we shouldn't work at, look at in the wet lab. So it allows us to refine our hypothesis, would be the, the phrase that we'd use in academia. And we hope that it allows us to reduce research waste because we're not spending time, resources, plastics, cells, reagents, chemicals on things that aren't going to work. We hope, at least. Um, I can't provide you with conclusive evidence on that yet because this is such a new thing that we can't really do some sort of systematic review of counter drug development that started with publicly available data versus cancer drug development that just jumped straight into the wet lab. We don't have that yet. We, we can't know yet, but theoretically, you know, it should really, really help to improve our chances. Like I say, it should help to reduce that research waste. It should help to refine that, that hypothesis as we're going along. And I really hope that that overall means that as a field, we can increase our success rates of new anti-cancer drugs that's something that we probably don't highlight too often on this, this channel because we try to be a source of positive energy here and really give cancer patients and carers and fundraisers um, the good news and the exciting things that are happening in cancer. But just to be pessimistic for a moment, actually the vast majority of, of cancer research drugs fail. Um, most of them never even make it to clinical trial and of the ones that do make it to clinical trial, most of them don't get approved. Now there's lots of reasons for that and it deserves its own whole series of videos, never mind its own video. But one of the many ways in which we're trying to improve that is this, is by really accessing all of the data that's available to us, being very careful about what we do in the lab, 
so that we can ultimately work smart and not hard. Um, save time, look at the right things, and hopefully have a better chance that the drugs that we're working on actually make it all the way to clinic and start saving lives. So while that's a bit of a, a, a pessimistic kind of reality check on, on cancer drug development, I hope it also serves to give you some hope that as a field, we are going in an improved direction. We have a lot of amazing data that we can work with and play with and have fun with. And we're, we're hopefully getting there as, as a team, as a, a team all over the world. So thank you very much for watching. If I was successfully able to get a little hello from Nafisa, I will insert that now. Um, and then I will see you just after. I'm just jumping in from clinic to say hi. I'm so excited that the paper's out and can't wait to see how future students take this work forward. Okay, so thank you for Nafisa for, for that. It's really nice to see you and I can't wait to actually meet you face to face at some point, hopefully very soon. Um, it's, it's been fun recording this one today. It's great to be back to YouTube and I hope to continue doing more soon. Um, with that, I'm going to end the video. Please um, do support our channel if you can. The ways that you can do that is by liking this video, subscribing to our channel, sharing it with your friends, uh, share it with any patient support groups that you're a part of, share it with any student societies that you're a part of. Hopefully you can tell that from the tone of these videos you're really hoping to reach both cancer patients and their loved ones, as well as budding cancer researchers who are kind of just getting into this space. So if you know anyone who, fil who falls into either of those categories, please do share our, our work with them. Um, and of course, you can follow us on all of the other social media places as well. We're on uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Reddit. I think we're, we're on Tumblr. <laughs> but you, can, you, can, you can find us in most places under Cancer Research Demystified. Um, thank you for supporting us. We really do appreciate it. And hopefully I will see you very soon.